want to welcome everybody tuning in on the internet. What is the church? This is part two. Before we get into this, we're in the seizing of what's called the counting of the Omer, Omer in Hebrew. And um, so in Leviticus 23, 9, Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you and you reap the harvest, then you'll bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before Yahweh to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest will wave it. And then you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. How many Sabbaths? Seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwellings two wave loaves of two tenths of an ephah, and they shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are first fruits to the Lord. And Jessica, if you're in the back there, you do make some of the best holla in the universe. And I hear that people are just gathering all over at the Olofsson's house to sample the good holla on Shabbats now. They just have to, we're going to have to kick down some walls and expand because the holla is so good. And if you didn't get some a couple weeks ago, you missed out. Cream cheese, blueberry, saturated holla loaves this big, man. She don't play around. The rabbis have set it up to where we have two loaves of challah on Shabbat. Now, in, a, in an Orthodox home, they actually will have two loaves of challah, not just one. If you're following Orthodox Judaism, some of us don't have any challah. It's okay. Those are just traditions. But the two loaves of challah represent Israel and Judah and all the nations that are gathered. And on Shavuot, which is coming up, it's customary that each person brings at least a loaf of hala to Shavuot. And last year what we did is everybody brought their hala, and then we waved it before the Lord. Why? Because the Bible says to bake two loaves from your dwelling. You make the hala, you bring it to first fruits and you do this. I mean because uh, Shavuot is a first fruits. It's the wheat harvest first fruits. It's actually us. The barley, the first fruits, the resurrection is Yeshua, and then we are represented in the loaves with leaven. So everybody will bring their bread, and then we'll share it with each other, okay? Um, but here's where we are. We're told to count seven weeks to the day after the seventh Sabbath, and that'll bring us to the feast called Pentecost, which is Shavuot. And here's an interesting thing. I was born and raised in a Pentecostal church. Never once did we celebrate the holiday. Never, I mean, they'll talk some tongues like crazy. Run on the top of the things, cartwheels. Never once celebrate the holiday. No, no teaching, no, hey, we count. They didn't even count from Easter. No counting, nothing. But we are to count. I get better each year. I have not mastered the counting of the Omar yet. Look, I've been doing this years there's days I just keep on going. But we're actually told to number each and every day. And to me, it's kind of like a reverse countdown. 10, 9, 8, 7. We're counting up. When you get to 50, the explosion happens. Okay? So this is week 3, the third Sabbath, day 21. Okay? And so you count seven Sabbaths, then you add a day, and it takes you to Shavuot. Now, there are people on a different calendar. If you're following Michael Rood and you did first fruits on May 1st, then you're, you're, you're going to keep Shavuot on the 19th instead of the 12th. We've w reviewed that for the last several weeks prior to starting this series. So, we're studying the word church. Well, we did that last week. We looked at the Greek and the Hebrew definitions and the understandings of what the word church actually means. Um, and so this is just the rest of the outline for us. Today we're going to look at synonyms and metaphors. So there's this thing called the church. Now most of us, were, how many were raised in a church setting? Okay. If you weren't raised in a church setting, how many of you went to church before coming here? Okay. All right. So, um, 
there's this thing called church out there, and it operates um, as a religious system and not as a kingdom of priests. So the Lord is having us investigate this religious system, and um, anything that's not scriptural, God wants to reveal so that we can have a proper understanding of what is the church, what should it look like, how should it operate, okay? So we're going to look at these uh, synonyms and metaphors. Uh, one new man, a tree, a body, and a bride. A new man. So um, this one new man concept is a reference to Israel and Judah connecting with people from all the nations and becoming a new entity. Okay? A living, breathing organism empowered and indwelt with God's Spirit. And so that's what I believe is Paul is trying to actually get to when he talks about this one new man. And there are a lot of people using this phrase right now. Uh, our Jewish brothers are using this phrase. Sid Roth is using this phrase. Kurt Landry is using this phrase. A lot of Christians, Messianics... Hebrew roots, they're using this phrase, a one new man congregation. Why? It's God's timing for him to bring this one new man revelation to the surface so that we can understand exactly what it means. Why do I say that this one new man concept, this teaching is a reference to Israel and Judah is because um, what is Paul, it's, it's embedded in Ephesians when he's talking about Israel and Judah. And the nations. So here's what it says in Ephesians 2. Therefore remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, in Yeshua the Messiah, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. For he himself is our peace, and he has made both one. And he's broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile, reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity, and he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near through him. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore you are no, long, no longer strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Yeshua the Messiah himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And this last part right here that we have is going to be reintroduced later um, to give us understanding when we get to the whole idea of the church being a bride because that's another synonym and metaphor that we have as uh, that we're going to look at. So, this thing that we call the church, we learned last week the better way to literally and scripturally define that word church would be the called out assembly. So you can say assembly and you can say congregation. Those, those words all work, right? But God's congregation, God's assembly of people are made up of people that are biologically from Israel and people that are not biologically from Israel. And those two groups of people, God is bringing together to make them one new man. Okay? So that's what Paul is dealing with here. And that's why he starts out saying that you were once Gentiles in the flesh... But now in the Messiah, you're a part of this, you're a grafted in part of Israel. And what God is doing is he is taking two groups and bringing them together so that they can live and worship together. That's the goal, okay? 
The congregation, the church, is also um, called a tree in many, 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 many scriptures. Okay? So, one of the things we looked at last week is this word that we use called church is not about, like scripturally, it's not about the building. So, we say stuff like, I'm going to church. Right? But really, you are the church. People say that all the time. So, the word itself, ecclesia, and the Old Testament word kahal, are actually about us as a group of people. So the group of people, God's called out assembly, are also called one new man. Because when we put aside, the Bible says there's no more Greek, nor Jew, no male, no female. When we all come together, we put all those things together... We are a new entity called a new man. There was Adam. He fell. There was Yeshua. He came to restore. And now there's this new man indwelt with the Holy Spirit called the congregation, the called out assembly. And another metaphor and synonym is a tree. Check this out in Romans 11. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry, if by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. So here in Romans 11 is one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible because... As I begin to walk out Hebraic understanding, this chapter of the Bible came alive to me. Okay? And so now we get to this place to where Paul is referring to us as having roots and branches. Okay? So he says, if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree. So here he's saying... God's people are defined as a wild olive tree. And you are grafted in. It's a technical term. Among them, and you became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. And you will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off. Just say the word broken off. And you stand only by your faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For God did not spare the natural branches. He may not spare you either. Therefore consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell. Severity, but towards you, on those who fell it was, it was severe. But toward you it was good if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise you'll also be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is, what's that say? Wild. And were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated tree. How much more will these, who are the natural branches, be grafted into There. That is so... That word right there changes everything. Their own olive tree. Okay? So God looks at us. First of all, we have biological descendants of, of Israel, right? And then you have everybody else. Now the biological descendants of Israel ended up being split into two groups. Right? Right? And one of the groups got scattered and mixed in with this other group to the point to where you can't even tell them apart. And nobody knows. Okay? And when Paul is addressing people that have come to faith into the Messiah, once they've come to faith, they become what he calls a part of an olive tree. And he said, if you were out in the world doing whatever you want, you're wild. 
And what he said is that you've been grafted into a natural tree, which God says has been cultivated. And for those of us that don't know, the cultivated olive tree means that it's been pruned and it's been kept by obedience to the Torah and the commands. Okay? That's exactly what that means. And it says even some of those were broken, and in their place the wild ones were broken in, uh, grafted in. But the Catholic Church has said this. Here's what they say. The olive tree itself is the mother church. It's the Catholic Church. And so what they say is that Jewish people that are become believers in the Messiah have to put away Judaism and become Christians and get grafted into the Catholic Church. So what they teach is exact opposite of what the Bible really says. So we know that the natural olive tree of Israel is the biological descendants, sons and daughters. And the wild tree is all those from the nations. And they come together and they make one tree. And that tree is an olive tree, which is a synonym for the called out assembly, which is a synonym for the one new man. So follow me so far. Okay. Now, this concept of God's people being viewed as a tree does not begin in the New Testament with the church. Okay, I'm going to show you where the foundation for this is. In Hosea, here's what the Bible says. He will spread, his branches shall, shall spread. Who's his? And his beauty shall be like an olive tree, and his fragrance like the Lebanon. And those who dwell under his shadow shall return. God speaking in the end days about the house of Israel, not Judah. Say the house of Israel. Okay? So the house of Israel is viewed as an olive tree. This is not... Here's the thing that we got to realize. I say this a lot. Paul's not making brand new stuff up. His, all his concepts are coming from the Torah and the prophets. So this whole thing of God's people being an olive tree has its foundation there, okay? The Psalms even says the same thing, but I am like a green olive tree in the house of God, and I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. So again, the psalmist is saying that he's referring to himself as an olive tree. Now check this out. The whole concept of branches being broken off, again, it did not begin in Romans. Jeremiah prophesying says, The Lord called your name green olive tree, lovely and of good fruit, with the noise of a great tumult. Tumult? He has kindled fire on it. And, what's that say? Its branches are broken. So Paul's not in the New Testament making this whole thing up that God has an olive tree and he broke some branches off. His foundation is in the prophets. And he says, For the Lord of hosts who planted you has pronounced doom against you for the evil of the house of Israel and the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger. What did they do? They offered incense to Baal. Now, at the end of the teaching last week, we looked at how the word Baal is husband. Say husband. And we looked at how the feasts, the root word for feast, ya'ad, means to betroth. And so the feasts are actually covenant marriage terms and appointments only for God and His bride. And that's why it's so dangerous in Christianity that our friends and family are doing holidays that aren't in the Bible. Because when you do holidays that aren't in the Bible and you don't do God's holidays, you are taking for yourself another lover and another husband. And the picture that God is painting for us begins with Israel and Judah doing the same thing that believers are doing today. Does that make sense? So when we mix worship, 
that equates to branches being broken off because you have unbelief. You're not believing in the true God and His way to worship. Does that make sense? Zechariah also says this, And the angel who talked with me came back and awakened me as a man who has wakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, What do you see? And I said, I'm looking, and there's a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it. And on the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes to seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other at its left. And I answered and said, What are these two olive trees at the right of the lampstand and at its left? And I further answered and said to him, What are these two olive branches? that drip into the receptacles of the two golden pipes. And he answered and he said to me, Don't you know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. These are the two anointed one that stands beside the Lord of the whole earth. Now here's an amazing picture. This is supposedly a vision of what's going on in what we call heaven, which in a couple of months we're going to get into this whole thing of what is heaven, where is heaven, how do we understand heaven. My daughters asked me that the other day. What is heaven? Where is it? Okay? And so, the vision of a giant menorah with two olive trees and two clusters of, oil, two clusters of olives draining into a menorah is in the heavenlies. It's also in the earth. Okay? So, again, Paul's not making brand new stuff up here when he's talking about his people being viewed as an olive tree. Does it make sense? Is everybody awake? I get just one nod. It makes me concerned what's going on. Maybe wheels are turning or sleepy time. Somebody got some... Um, um, no. Somebody says... No, I'm, I'm fine. I'm feeling good. I'm worried about y'all. <laughs> and even in the New Testament here, we see this. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. Trees can have good fruit or bad fruit. Talking, is this really about fruit? It's about people. Listen. For a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers. How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. So again, a reference to people or trees. Now here's what's the danger in this. Have you heard, raise your hand if you've heard of the serpent seed theology. Now, the serpent seed theology takes this concept that people are trees and puts it all the way into the Garden of Eden to the two trees in the Garden of Eden are actually become people. And when Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that that tree itself was Satan. And she didn't actually eat from a fruit. She had sexual intercourse. And when she gave to her husband, he had sexual intercourse. And people actually believe this and change their whole life and their whole view of Scripture based on this interpretation that trees are people, even in the Garden of Eden. Eden, it's not scriptural. Um, The literal definition of Scripture has to stand even when we add the deeper levels on it. So the deeper levels of understanding Scripture can never cancel out the literal meaning of Scripture. Does that make sense? A tree has to be a tree, and then it can be other stuff, okay? So, a congregation is a man, a congregation is um, a tree, and the congregation is also a body. The body of Christ, the body of the Messiah. So, um, this is actually looked at in two ways in the Scripture. Um, One is it's a synonym for the church, the ecclesia, the congregation. The other is the body is um, what most people call communion, right? The body and the blood. This is my body given for you. So if you're in a Christian church and whenever they do communion, they bring the ushers, they have the, the, the stuff, they come up front and at some point an elder or the pastor says, take and eat, this is his body given for you. And do this in remembrance of me. They take the cup and they drink and everybody does communion. 
So the body of Christ is two things in Scripture. It's the elements that we take that we know only are to be connected, in my opinion, only need to be connected to Passover. So, um, and the other way is what we're going to look at is uh, uh, connected to the congregation. And Ephesians 5 says, For the husband is the head of the wife, and Christ is the head of the assembly, being himself the Savior of the what? The body. It's interesting that God um, uses these references about us. We are his body. We are literally his hands and feet. If you don't do the things that God has ordained for you to do on earth... I've seen things, I've seen people that God has called to do certain things. And if they don't actually do what God's called them to, I've watched the Lord raise up somebody else to fulfill what they were supposed to do. Because God will make things happen. And if we mess up, it just gets delayed. And when it gets delayed, it can affect people's lives. Do you know we can really make mistakes that change the destiny of, of people's lives. The Bible says that in the wilderness there was a rock, and that rock was Christ. Right? Now, that actual rock, and I think they know if you've studied Michael Rood and you know who Ron Wyatt is, they found the real Mount Sinai and they found the real rock that the water came out of. It's about taller than the ceiling. It's split in half. It has valleys embedded in the stone that go around in circles and ran out so everybody could get water. But here's the interesting thing. That rock was supposed to be a picture of Yeshua. So Yeshua came. Yeshua has two comings, right? The first time Yeshua came, he was smitten. He was stricken and he was afflicted. So God says to Moses, hit the rock. Whoosh, the water comes out. Yahweh says to Moses, go speak to the rock and watch the water come. And if Moses would have followed exactly what the Lord said, the picture would have been a perfect representation recorded in Scripture for us. That the second time the Messiah comes, he is declared the one that the rock, the one that the water's from, the Messiah of Israel. Just speak. The Bible says that when he comes the second time, the voice of the archangel will blast and the trump of God and the declaration will be all over the planet. You know what? Moses literally messed up. He hit the thing. It messed up a picture that God was trying to paint in the Bible for us of Christ. Isn't that interesting? It messed up the picture. And for that disobedience, he was hindered. You can't go into the promised land. Isn't that something? It's fascinating. I'm... I personally believe Scripture is still being written today with our lives. I believe in equidistant letter skipping. And I believe that we're in there embedded in the Scriptures. And I believe that as we live our lives, the stories are still being written. So who knows what kind of spiritual picture Yahweh Elohim is trying to paint in your life for other people to see and for the angels and the fallen angels and the demons. That's why we got to be so careful that we don't mess up. We don't step out of order. We do exactly what he says. We say exactly what he says and we don't miss his timing. Timing is one of the biggest things I see people struggle with in the body. Again, in Colossians.
Paul's talking about Yeshua having a body, which is what? Now, most translations will say right there, his body is the church. It's the assembly. 1 Corinthians 12, Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with the Messiah. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles. There's the whole one new man thing, slave or free. We were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one parts, but many. And now he defines it right here. You are the body of the Messiah, and each of you is a part of it. So, the called out assembly is a man, a tree, and a body. All right? Members of the body of Christ are joined to Christ in salvation. So we all are connected spiritually to the Messiah when we're born again. Members of the body follow Christ as their head. Members of the body are physical representation of Him in the earth. In the church, the called out assembly is the organism through which Christ manifests His life world today. Members of the body are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Members of the body possess many gifts, and the body, although it is one, has many parts. Members of the body share a common bond with all other believers. Amen? And this is, this is deep stuff here, because... How many of you have ever tried to like figure out predestination, election, and all that stuff? Have fun. I hope you're smart. Okay? But if... No, I'm not here to wrestle about it. But if we were in Christ before the foundation of the earth, we believe that. That means he already had a body. That means we were already there. Okay, so what this says is, is he going to have a body part, a finger over there, pre-humans, and then get here and have it cut off? You know, can a, can a truly born-again person lose their salvation? We're not going there, but let me just tell you about my dad. My dad went from being a preacher of the gospel, a pastor, to complete rebellion for years 30 years probably sinning like a crazy person he just got recalled back into the ministry he's quit smoking quit drinking quit all this junk called me the other day crying because God's dealing with him again you know what he said he said I never left the Lord and he never left me why he had a real experience way back then and as far as he would try to get away from dad, dad was grabbing him. Son, son, come here, son. Again, there's a thousand scriptures on both sides of that fence that we're not going to get into right now. But members of the body partake in Christ's death and resurrection. Members of the body share in his inheritance. And members of the body receive gifts. Amen? So also a bride. This last part about the bride is going to carry us over into next week, which is um, a lot of cool stuff that we will get into next week. But until I came to Hebraic understanding and got trained with Rabbi Joe, my understanding, and listen, I was in church, okay? I had Sunday school and all that stuff. My understanding of the bride was only New Testament, but I did have an understanding of the bride. What was it called? The bride of who? The bride of who? We hear that all the time, right? Okay, so I knew about that whole thing. But what God is going to show us, if he hasn't shown you already, is this whole bride thing started a long time ago. Jeremiah says, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a lovely and Delicate woman. Okay? 
I have put my words in your mouth. I have covered you with the shadow of my hand that I may plant the heavens, lay the foundations of the earth, and say to Zion, You are my people. So Zion... represents God's people, which is also called a woman, a delicate, tender woman. Okay? Yeshua symbolizes His true, pure church or assembly, Zion, as a pure woman. And the apostate church or the apostate assembly is always the hooker, the harlot, the prostitute, the one that has run off Abandon the lover of her soul, abandon the true way to worship, and incorporated the ways of the nations. And so it's very important for us to grasp that. And listen, when you share, as the Lord opens up opportunities with friends and family that are actually sincerely seeking these things, knowing that the root word for the word feast means to betroth is key. You understand? Because the feasts are how we stay to our stay connected to our husband. They are the yearly dates that we have. It's how we get intimate with our husband. Because truly, that's who he is to us. Most Christians only know about the bride of Christ as mentioned in a few New Testament verses, but we will see that this concept of God having a bride runs through the whole Bible. The scriptures are actually a love story about God the husband and his bride, which is the called out assembly. That's what the Bible is about. God created people. The enemy we call Satan, one of the fallen angels, leader of the rebellion decided to attack God's children as a way to mess with God. And I've said this before, we're all stuck in a cosmic battle that's way out of our hands. We can't fix it. We can't do anything but sit and wait on God to make everything right. It's all up to Him. Okay? And you're victorious because you're stuck in the middle because one of his created beings has decided to mess with his apple of his eye. So don't worry. God's got it. Amen? We're victorious in the end because he's victorious. When I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you were at the age for love. And I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. And I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord God, and you became mine. So God, many, many times through the scriptures, is painting a picture of God entering into a covenant relationship, a marriage, a real marriage with his people. He saw how much we needed him. He took his mantle, his talit, he covered and said, you are mine. And then in Isaiah, for your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel, your Redeemer, is the God of the whole earth. And that's what he is called. Now, a lot of people look at this and say, oh, that's just, uh, you know, he really doesn't mean he's our husband. It's actually a real thing that we'll get into next week, Okay. Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem, Thus says the Lord, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Now again, look, we're talking about Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, all of these prophets of Israel using this whole concept that God's a husband, his people are the bride. Interesting, isn't it? I said that already. Next week we'll explore the scriptural truth of God having a bride and how and when this husband and wife relationship began. For I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you 
to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. This is the calling of a minister. Here's what we do as ministers. Our goal is to bring people to the Messiah, get them into the right relationship, teach them how to love Him and walk with Him, get them mature, and then you let them go. Let God deal with people. That's what God wants. God wants us to get to the place to where each of us are walking in a relationship with Him, developing, falling in love, talking to one another, going on dates. That's why Shabbat is so important. So important Friday night that you gather around with your family or if you're all by yourself, it doesn't matter. You get around the table and you have fellowship with the husband. So this concept of God having a God being a husband, having his people as a bride, following over into the New Testament, again, Paul's not making stuff up out of the blue. What he's doing is saying, look, God has always been the God of Israel, right? And he writes in Colossians and he says, the mystery of Christ is that you people from the nations actually can also share in this covenant and also get married, have a husband, have a relationship with the one true God. It's a mystery. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church, the assembly, and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, a glorious congregation, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she, he should be that, that she should be holy and without blemish. See, it's interesting that it's a she, right? She, she, she. Um, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as the Lord does the called out assembly. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, the two will become one flesh. This, listen, this is a great mystery. Let me just tell you how the, where does this mystery start? We're a new man. There was a first Adam, there was a second Adam, and then there's this new man. Hear me. How can we be female and male. In the beginning, God created them, male and female. God created man. That's what the Hebrew says. And God did this amazing thing from this male-female entity. In the Hebrew, it's male-female entity. Don't ask me to explain it. I did a teaching on it before. Most English translations say out of the side he pulled this woman. They were one, they became two. Actually, our Jewish brothers teach, as crazy as this sounds, listen, do you know that there are cherubim, say cherubim, how many faces do they have? No, so, all right. So this is a real thing in the Bible. Four faces, six wings, cow feet. We all know that's real. Our Orthodox Jewish brothers teach that when God made man and woman, they were back to back, two faces. Literally in the Hebrew, it says God cut the back off, peeled it away, and formed a whole new person. Is that really what happened? I don't know. That's what it says in the Hebrew. We like to think that he just pulled a rib out. It's not the word rib. Could he have pulled a rib out? He could have. We just lost half the people. I gotta say what the Bible says, okay? But this is the mystery. This whole thing of a man and a woman. They're married, they become one. The body is called 
his body, but it's also a woman. It's deep stuff. I don't understand it all. Now listen to this. This bride getting ready to change right in front of us. Check this out. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. Amen. His bride has made herself ready. Who's that? Say me. And, and, and it was granted to her, the bride, right? Everybody follow me? To make herself ready and to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. This bride is a her clothed with fine linen, righteousness of the Messiah, right? That's me. Blessed are those who invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are truly the words of God. So this bride here is God's people, right? Yes, shake your heads. Yes. Now check this out. Then came one of the seven angels who had seven bowls full of the last seven plagues and spoke to me saying, Come and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me what? Now all of a sudden, this thing called the bride, which we just said was us, turns into a city coming down from heaven. Are they the same? Are they two different brides? Does God have three brides? Jehovah has a bride, Christ has a bride, and there's another bride called the New Jerusalem. Or are they all the same that we just got to wrap our minds around? Coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God and its radiance was like the most rare jewels, like jasper and clear as crystal. So here, the bride is the city, the new Jerusalem. Interesting, isn't it? How is this thing a city and people? Now, therefore, you know you're no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Yeshua the Messiah himself being the... What? Now, I said this before. Yeshua was not a carpenter. He didn't get splinters. He didn't have a hammer, and he didn't build houses made of wood. I don't care what anybody says. He was a stonemason. He worked with rocks. He would have had forearms, man. He could have stomped you in arm wrestling. He was not wimpy. He was a strong man. Okay? That's my opinion. All the stuff about stones only makes sense there. You understand? It was about his father's business who was building a house made out of stones. Do you know that God was in, God's even in the process now of putting together this house made out of living stones? And Yeshua is about his father's business. So, Yeshua is a cornerstone. In him the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you're also being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. All these shadows first... The Mishkan, the tabernacle, the tent, right? The priesthood in the tabernacle. Then, the physical structure, the temple itself, first, second temple, the third temple. Then you have this thing called the New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, called the bride. Some things in Scripture we just have to let sit, and you need to marinate on it, okay? You just got to what the Bible says. Are they all a picture of us? The Bible says that they are. How do we understand that? I don't have any idea how it all works. Okay? But if we are all being prepared to make a spiritual tabernacle, then that's how that could fit into the picture there. Does that make sense? A little bit. No, it doesn't, but it does. Yeah. Hey, I'm up here teaching it and I'm trying to figure it out. Okay? I don't have all the answers, okay? I get worried when preachers have everything figured out. <laughs> I mean, seriously. I've asked pastors questions that they didn't have the answer for. I, I have 
they'll make something up right there. I've watched it. Instead of say, I don't know, I've, I've watched it happen. So, I don't understand all this. Next week, we're going to start right here, and we're going to look at this. This whole bride thing began in the wilderness. In the wilderness. So, Egypt had millions of slaves, and there was a little pocket of these slaves that were from descendants of um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when he pulls these biological descendants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, out with all the plagues, and they put the blood on the door, a whole lot of other people, a mixed multitude comes out. And when they get to Mount Sinai and they have the very first Shavuot, and the Ten Commandments are given, they get a ring, they have an anniversary, there's a husband, a bride, and a presiding minister. There's a wedding that happens right there. From that point on, God's married to this people. At some point they split. He actually divorced. God actually ends up having two wives. He ends up divorcing one. And this whole thing, the marriage supper of the Lamb, this whole marriage ceremony, part of this whole marriage is going to be that God is doing, He's going to have a remarriage ceremony to the lost sheep of the house of Israel because He divorced them. It's deep. Check out the teaching on YouTube called The Husband Must Die for a glimpse into that, okay? Hallelujah. Father, thank You for giving us Your Word. Lord, we want to know who we are and what we are. We want to know what you're doing on earth with this thing that we call the church, with your assembly. So, Father, we thank you that you've opened your word today and given us a glimpse of our past, present, and our future. And Father, I thank you for Shabbat. Thank you for each one that's here. Thank you for the food that we're going to eat. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen.